In Monty Python's film, Life of Brian, the main character and his mother are accosted by a beggar in the streets of Jerusalem who cries out, alms for an ex-leper. This ex-leper is upset that Jesus healed him without so much as a by your leave and has ruined his livelihood. He once had a dependable trade in begging, but now that's gone. He considers asking Jesus to return him to leprosy, but thinks that's too painful, or at least to make him lame in one leg midweek. It seems there are some people that you just can't please. An ex-leper upset at being healed, and our reading from John's Gospel have something in common. Let's take a look. John's story of the healing of the man at the pool of Bethzatha is unique, but shares some features of other stories in the Gospels. It's unique that in, only in John's Gospel do we find this particular story of a man healed by a pool. It's also unique because in this story, Jesus heals someone in Judea or Jerusalem. The other Gospels place his healings elsewhere. Archaeologists have located this pool in the northeast part of the city, which as John's Gospel says, has five porticos or porches. On the north side of the temple court, excavations have confirmed John's knowledge of this feature of the Jerusalem temple. The name Beth Zatha, or Beth Seda, or Bethesda, comes from the Hebrew Bet Chesed, or House of Mercy. It's both an ironic name and place setting for this story because when the sick man tried to get into the waters while they were stirred up, others got ahead of him. He receives no mercy from others who are ill around him, but meets mercy itself in Jesus. A final unique feature of this story from John is one we didn't hear this morning in our reading. Verse 4, found in the King James Version, isn't found in the best and oldest manuscripts of John, which were unavailable to the translators in 1611. Verse 3 reads, In these porticos lay many invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. And a later scribe added this verse, And they were waiting for the stirring of the water. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever stepped in after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease that person had. This verse was added by a later editor trying to make sense of verse 7, where the man tells Jesus about his inability to get into the pool when the water is stirred up because others go ahead of him. This extra verse, interestingly enough, is the origin of the spiritual wade in the water, whose chorus sings, wade in the water, wade in the water, children, wade in the water, gods are gonna trouble the water. Despite these unique features of this story from John's Gospel, it shares similarities with another story found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That story is the healing of the paralytic, where four people lower their paralyzed friend through the roof so that he may be healed by Jesus. Both healings provoke controversy with the religious authorities, and both involve the question of sin. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus asked the religious authorities, which is easier to say? 
your sins are forgiven, or rise, take up your mat, and walk. In John, he tells the man, see, you've been made well. Do not sin anymore. The command Jesus gives to rise, take up your mat, and walk is the verbatim command we hear in all four Gospels, word for word. In the story of the man being lowered through the roof, it's not his faith that Jesus sees, but the faith of the four friends, which leads to his healing. In the story of the man by the pool of Bethzatha, there's no mention of any friends or his faith at all, nor anyone else's. This point is the key to understanding the story. Jesus takes the initiative in this healing, and it has absolutely nothing to do with the man's faith. It is pure grace, pure mercy that moves Jesus to heal this man. This unique story shares similarities with other healing stories. And within it, we'll find healing for ourselves. Jesus comes to the paralyzed man and asks him, Do you want, wish, will to be well, healed, whole? Jesus isn't being chatty as if he were saying, how's it going? Nice weather we're having, isn't it? Jesus isn't seeking information as if he's unaware of the man's condition. For we're told Jesus knew he had been there a long time. Jesus in John operates with divine knowledge, seeing Nathanael under a fig tree, knowing the Samaritan woman had five husbands, and having a plan for feeding the crowd of 5,000, even before asking Philip. So why do we think Jesus ask this question of the man. For in John, Jesus questions like his answers have multiple layers of meaning. It isn't a foolish question either, as if anyone could plainly see this man wanted, wished, willed to be well, healed, whole. What seems at first a no-brainer question is upon further reflection a profound one. Do you want to be made whole? Do you really will it? Do you desire it more than anything? Think about it. This man had been there a long time, possibly 38 years. Maybe he'd set up shop under a little scrap of canvas. Perhaps such a long time of begging had earned him the best spot for alms. With his ruined legs splayed out in the midst of people's walkway, we'd be hard-pressed to ignore him. And in that moment where we had to slow down to avoid stepping on him, he'd look to us for mercy with a cup in his hand extended. And more often than not, we'd give him a little something, a few coins at least. This man's identity is wrapped up in his illness. He was a victim of life and had gotten crushed under its wheels. He'd made the best of a bad situation and for 38 years had been begging alms, dependent on the kindness of strangers. 38 years would shape his personality, particularly given that the average lifespan then was only 22 years. 
he had lived almost two lifespans with this illness. The only other mention of 38 years in the Bible is in Deuteronomy 2.14, the period Israel spent in the wilderness between Egypt and the Promised Land, a time of rebellion and grumbling. It was in the wilderness time that the present generation had to die out in order that a new one might be born, one whom God could take into the Promised Land. Jesus, in John's symbolic richness, is asking this man, in effect, do you want to die to the only way of life you've ever known? Do you want to continue grumbling in your familiar wilderness of paralysis, or take a step into the uncharted territory of the promised land? where you can be reborn right here, right now. Jesus asked the man, do you want, wish, well, to be well, healed, whole? The question Jesus directs to the man by the pool echoes across the centuries to us. Do we really want to be well? Do we honestly wish to be healed? Do we truly will to be whole? And for a nation and a people obsessed by health, we might easily take offense at the question. We get our annual checkups, watch our cholesterol levels, count calories. We may have the occasional sniffles now and then, but not long-term illness. That's not how we see ourselves. Us? Sick? Jesus question seems ill-suited to our day and time with our cultural fixation on being healthy. Our prevailing medical model of health sees patients as collections of symptoms and has increasing specialization among physicians who treat only the lower left quadrant of the pinky toe. With the proliferation of alternative medicine, chiropractors, homeopathic medicines, and acupuncture, to name a few, we see an increasing understanding of what's called the mind-body connection. People are rebelling against the old model of health and defining it more broadly than simply bodily wholeness, and including emotional well-being, relational integrity, mental functioning, and spiritual aliveness. Defining health that broadly, perhaps we're not as well as we once thought. This is the kind of health that Jesus brings to us, and we see it in this story. When Jesus later finds the man he cured, he said, See, you've been made well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. Being made well included more than simply being able to walk. It also meant walking in righteousness. It was more than a physical cure that Jesus was giving him. It was a spiritual prescription to avoid sin, which cripples the spirit and is worse than physical paralysis. Jesus understood the mind-body-spirit-body connection and comes to bring healing in all aspects of our lives, physically, emotionally, relationally, mentally, and spiritually. 
when we look at ourselves honestly across that broad a spectrum of true health, we find ourselves on our own mats with crippling dependencies, counterproductive strategies for living, destructive negative emotions, anxious, fearful, and hostile. Us? Sick? Yes, sick unto death, yearning for that balm of Gilead that makes the wounded whole and heals the sin-sick soul. We'd like to believe that if the possibility of healing came our way, we'd enthusiastically respond. Sister Joan Chittister tells a story of a man who came to a holy person seeking healing. The holy person listened patiently as the man listed his complaints and then asked, Do you really want to be cured? The man was shocked by the question and said, Of course I want to be cured. Why else would I have come? To which the holy person replied, Most come not to be cured. That is too painful. They come for relief. Honestly, most of us prefer our 38 years of stagnant status quo paralysis. We'd like to think that we jump at the chance at health, but begging off others and playing the victim has become all we know of ourselves. There are beggars in places like Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, who purposefully maintain an open wound on their leg to gain sympathy and cash from tourists. They have a dependable trade in begging. It's their livelihood. Consider the contrast between wound lickers and wound pickers. Wound lickers acknowledge the pain, but don't remain fixated on it. They lick their wounds and move on. Wound pickers, on the other hand, never let it heal, but keep picking at it and showing it to others so that it stays a raw, oozing, festering sore that can infect the whole body. We all know wound pickers. We've met them. These are folks who just can't let go of past hurts and play the victim and elicit sympathy from others, sometimes even getting cash. But if it's not financial begging they're doing, it's emotional begging that ensnares us and seeks our valuable time. They may have been a victim once in their life, but it doesn't give them the right to play the victim for the rest of their life. And let's be honest, We've not only met wound pickers, we've been them in our life too. We've been the ones with our tin cups extended, seeking alms from others, inviting them to join us in our pity party. Misery loves company. And there we are, stuck on our mats with open wounds upon us, body, mind, and soul. And we hear Jesus say to us, Do you want to be made well? Jesus takes the initiative in healing us, and it has absolutely nothing to do with our faith. It is 
pure grace, pure mercy that moves him to heal us. He sees us there and knows we've been sick a long time. So, do we want to die to the only way of life we've ever known? Do we want to continue grumbling in our familiar wilderness of paralysis? Or take a step into the uncharted territory of the promised land where we can be reborn right here, right now? Do we want to remain wounded and reclining? Or take up our mat and walk instead. Amen. If you'd like